and welcome to today's webinar, Smart Buildings, Internet of Things, and What It All Means for Your Career. I'm Ann Cosgrove, the Editor-in-Chief of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented by Daintree Networks. Thanks for joining us. Before we get started, I'll cover a few housekeeping items. Please note the control panel on your screen. This is where you can submit questions to our speakers via the question box in that panel. Please send these questions in at any time, and our speakers will address them after the presentation. Also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of that control panel. Clicking on that arrow will either expand or collapse the panel, so you want to be sure that panel is expanded so you can access the question box. If at any time during the presentation you experience a technical difficulty, please send a message to us via that question section also, and we'll answer you right away. Now let's get started and meet your speakers today. Derek Prudian is Chairman and Chief Executive Officer at Daintree. He is an industry IT veteran who has been tracking the internet revolution since his first job working at SRI on the ARPANET while a computer science student at Stanford University in 1980. Derek has a wealth of experience in various areas of technology, including IP switches, artificial intelligence, hardware, big data, internet services, mobile data, and optical components. He has held CEO roles at five venture back capital backed companies, including Zip2, Elon Musk's first company, which Derek sold to Compaq for more than $300 million. Your second speaker today will be Mandeep Kara. He is Vice President of Marketing and Channels for Daintree. His more than 20 years of experience spans various industries, including big data at Linux, mobile application development platform, security, web services, CRM, asset management, and logistics management. Previously, he was with Hewlett Packard in various functions, including as general manager of a software SAAS business unit focused on IT asset management. Mandeep is a graduate of Harvard Business School's Leading Product Development Program and Northwestern University's Executive Development Program. He also holds an MBA from Santa Clara University. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Derek. Uh, thanks very much, Ann. Uh, this is uh, Derek Prudian. And um, before we get started, I just wanted to, since I've been involved with the internet and, and its uh, impact on society for most of my life, uh, I thought I'd just give a just a quick uh, snapshot of, of uh, kind of historical historical perspective because I think we're with this um, transition to uh, the Internet of Things we're in, by, by my reckoning we're in the fourth phase of this kind of connectivity revolution uh, that I've seen since the uh, kind of dark days uh, uh, when I was uh, at, at SRI where really you had uh, mainframe and mini computers which were connected via uh, the ARPANET later later the Internet and that connectivity was pretty much confined to professionals in a, in a corporate world and, and researchers, but was a big boon by connecting uh, heretofore silos of uh, computing technology into computer networks. Uh, in the right around 1994, with the emergence of Mosaic and, and later Netscape um, and, and the browser technology, personal computers, which had been again standalone uh, devices that uh, consumers and small businesses use were connect connected via the consumer internet and that had obviously a huge impact on our society in in early 2000 uh, uh, mobile phones which had been primarily communications devices but without data were connected through data uh, 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 beginning really with the blackberry but accelerated dramatically with uh, the iPhone and, and smartphones and that uh, that wave uh, has, has basically changed the lives of, of uh, o over 3 billion people on the planet through that kind of uh, connectivity. And we're now in what I would see the fourth wave where all of these silos of independent operational technologies in buildings are starting to be connected via internet technologies into what people are calling uh, an internet of things. And I think this is uh, kind of an inevitable progression of connectivity connecting more and more uh, computer systems, people, uh, devices and, and now building technologies and so just g give give you some perspective that I think what we're going to talk about today is is part of uh, a, a sweep of things that's uh, that's moving through the industry in a, uh, a somewhat predictable pattern if you kind of look at it from the big uh, big picture um, go, going forward our agenda for today is I, I'm just going to give you a, an overview of some of the uh, building trends how um, IOT and um, smart buildings are being brought into the industry today, the relationship between IOT and operational technologies or OT and how those are, uh, uh, are, are blending, uh, blending together as we, as we go forward, um, 
how the, 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 the CIO world and the facilities world are, are also going to be coming together as a result of that, um, really coming from different perspectives. Uh, and then uh, 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 Mandeep will take over and give you some more details about uh, how, how those technologies work today, what you can be looking for in terms of, of ROI payback and, and how you should be evaluating systems going forward uh, and, and what it all means for you in terms of uh, uh, your day-to-day -day job and your careers going forward. So uh, with that, let me just move on um, from the uh, I into the very concrete world of building trends and issues uh, that I think everyone is facing today. Uh, there's no question that uh, utility bills um, are, are, are going up and that there is a, a mandate uh, both from uh, the corporate side of the world and also from uh, the, the, the government side of the world through uh, regulations to uh, mandate higher efficiency, better, better utilization of, of, of resources uh, driven by uh, legislation like Title 24, AF, ASHRAE, and, and an increasing uh, number of things that go forward there. Um, but beyond this kind of ROI-based energy savings, which, which people are looking at, there's also an increased focus on occupant comfort and, and other kinds of issues to raise the productivity, uh, both of the individual uh, workers in the buildings or in the, in, in the factories, um, to provide a, 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 you know, a better, better occupant uh, comfort or control of their environment, um, and also to use uh, the building itself as, a, as an asset for uh, a better utilization of resources uh, with, within the industry or as a, in retail sectors as a, as, as a way uh, to, to better engage with uh, customers. Um, and then we have a, a, a strong uh, sustainability drives, uh, in particular to reduce uh, the environmental impact and, and carbon footprints um, of buildings. So these are all trends that are, that are happening in buildings today. And, and it's not surprising uh, when you realize that, uh, you know, 40% of the world's energy use um, is is uh, dissipated through through buildings in one form or or another. So, um, but a uh, part of my point is that there is a, a confluence of energy, sustainability, productivity, and uh, customer engagement that's all coming together in in modern uh, modern buildings. Um, and that that creates uh, an issue for facilities uh, managers who are uh, 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 being uh, put into the position of having to uh, uh, de deliver more services while at the same time uh, reducing their budgets, meeting sustainability uh, goals, meeting uh, uh, building codes, um, and, uh, and and constant pressure on the uh, on on the bottom line says you need to do more with with less. Um, and uh, as as the number of systems that need to be managed goes up, unless there's some uh, 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 systematic way of managing those resources through uh, better uh, better controls, better views into uh, the resources of not just one building or one system like an HVAC system or a, 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 a safety system or a, a entrance system, a, a way to connect those devices so you can see all of the systems in a building and across multiple sites, it becomes more and more difficult uh, to manage that complexity with the resources that are uh, available. So. Uh, that's that's a sort of a snapshot of the, the problem that I think a lot of people are facing t t today. Um, uh, you know, uh, and 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 you know, obviously from the Daintree perspective, we we believe that uh, a a sensible solution that fits in both with the uh, kind of historical context of what's really happening uh, and has been happening in technology, the corporate world, and the consumer world over the last 40 years, but also is really happening today in the building uh, space. Is, is this Internet of Things. So I just wanted to give a quick uh, definition of, of what I think uh, uh, we, we mean by that. And, and we're talking right now uh, at, at, at this phase of development about uh, you know, networking together the physical objects, the devices uh, in a building, whether they be the lights or the thermostats or the um, blind controllers or the fire alarms or the occupancy sensors. Um, with uh, uh, technology that uh, uh, has some kind of um, uh, probably some kind of wireless or, or, or other kind of uh, technology for connecting those devices together so that they can interact with uh, other devices 
uh, over the internet to help achieve operational efficiencies for the manager. So you can uh, uh, you can see all of those devices. They can interoperate and they can be managed from uh, and 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 viewed. And the data that's generated from can be manipulated uh, in a, in a networked in a networked fashion. Uh, so that's really what we're talking about about the in Internet of Things. There's probably another chapter in this uh, saga, maybe chapter five, where uh, you get down to the things which themselves are not. Uh, devices with with radios in them, but are are actual lo locations or uh, 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 items with RFID tags. But we're not really talking about that at, at this point in time. Right now, we're talking about uh, connecting together siloed siloed systems of devices that uh, can interact with one another, um, much in the way in the very early days you took siloed. Uh, uh, Mini computers that each had uh, uses of their own, but you connected those together in a way that made the whole much greater than uh, than the, than the sum of its parts. Um, what can be connected? Uh, well, pretty much any any uh, any electric device uh, that uh, um, uh, that has any performs any function. So whether we're talking about uh, uh, lighting, uh, HVACs, plug loads, fans. CO2 sensors, carbon monoxide sensors, uh, access control, video surveillance, um, uh, any kind of fans, blind controllers, uh, you name it. Uh, and, and those can be connected to existing uh, uh, data systems, uh, energy, uh, uh, enterprise software for managing energy, uh, integration services with building automation systems, uh, uh, security systems and and other fire detection and, and 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 a whole host of things. So the 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 idea is that all of these kind of uh, what have traditionally been siloed independent systems begin to come together in a way that gives the the facility manager and the corporation uh, a, a, a a better view into uh, uh, into into what uh, uh, what's going on in the enterprise. Uh, and uh, according to IDC, uh, you know the, the 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 spending on this kind of technology um, is uh, was about uh, six uh, six point three billion dollars in in 2014, and that's uh, set to to triple uh, in the next few years to uh, over 17 17 billion dollars. Um, what's driving it? I mean, I think what's driving uh, enterprise level IoT is is many of the uh, the megatrends that that I touched on earlier, uh, cu coupled with very practical uh, uh, near-term concerns, which which tend to drive uh, the the big picture. So lower cost is at the at the top of the list. People are are looking to do more with less throughout uh, uh, enterprises, and in in general, the uh, the ability to uh, connect things and to uh, manage data. Uh, and sensors um, has has never been lower, and the ability to implement those things at a, on a, on a large scale and get the uh, uh, system level benefits um, has has in in recent years uh, recent years uh, based on the dramatic uh, 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 decrease in the cost of these things driven by uh, famous Moore's law of uh, of technology ha has made it the case that now. Uh, the the uh, internet revolution is down at the level where it's making it efficient to uh, connect not just uh, not just uh, mainframe computers and not just personal computers and not just mobile phones, but but lights and sensors and thermostats as as well. Um, sustainability, which is uh, 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 an independent thread, but one that's I think important to everyone uh, on, on planet Earth, is 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 become another major thread. We we need to not only uh, do do more with with less from a uh, corporate bottom line perspective. We need to do more with less uh, from a, 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 a global resource perspective, and that means uh, 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 using the technology you developed to be much more efficient in terms of our energy footprint, our water footprint, and other kinds of things. And, and some of these smart technologies can really go a long way in in dramatically uh, in improving the efficiency of of, of uh, of uh, uh, energy consumption and and resource consumption and and additional uh, additionally uh, provide uh, not just better uh, utilization of resources but overall better operational efficiency of of, of human expenditure by uh, reducing truck rolls to maintain 
uh, uh, to, to, to get preventive, preventative maintenance done um, by having advance warning that uh, a chiller on a rooftop is going to fail before it actually fails and causes uh, uh, causes problems. Um, and and all this is being uh, supported by uh, the uh, not only the reduced cost of connectivity and and, and devices, but by the the rapidly maturing. Um, uh, 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 overarching technologies of, of, of big data and cloud computing, the ability to uh, access your information resources uh, from your iPad or your, or your mobile phone, and, and open standards which make it possible for all these uh, heretofore heterogeneous systems to, to interconnect and interoperate in a way that, that, that makes, uh, uh, makes a, a, uh, the management of these resources a, across uh, m multiple disciplines and multiple uh, facilities possible. Um, and, 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 I, and I want to sort of put that in, in distinction to operational technology, which is, uh, I think, for most of us, a more familiar uh, uh, set of technologies. And these have been around for many years in the form of, uh, you know, large HVAC systems or other kinds of, of, of siloed systems, which uh, Provide the platforms used to operate physical assets in one in one dimension of enterprises. Uh, for example, uh, 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 electric uh, electric metering, uh, uh, HVAC systems such as the kind of uh, systems that you would get from a Johnson Controls or a, 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 a Siemens uh, factory floor systems of, of robotics, other kinds of, of operational technologies which um, have been designed and can be quite sophisticated for managing one dimension or one silo of 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 the uh, of, of a business um, and building control and management um, systems are you know an example of that kind of operational technology. What we're really talking about uh, here with uh, with uh, the enterprise IoT is on the one hand uh, bringing uh, technology in terms of of uh, control to parts of a building management system which typically have not been uh, computerized so uh, lighting systems very often have been uh, hardwired without a lot of uh, of um, controls involved or, or or only local controls such as uh, uh, an occupancy sensor, occupancy sensor which turns on and off the lights in a in, in a room um, those things are now because of the the the, the factors of of reduction of costs and increase of, of uh, capability uh, have made it affordable and practical to start to automate those kinds of systems and the needs to manage complexity. Um, in addition to uh, 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 stitching together the various silos of existing uh, building management, uh, building automation systems uh, from uh, an HVAC system to your security systems and other kinds of things uh, that 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 provide a, a unified view for the for the enterprise of managing their uh, the, their their businesses um, and uh, CIOs are uh, are are uh, quite aware of this uh, phenomenon uh, maybe less from the building management perspective uh, but more from the picture of looking uh, especially in in um, at, at the big picture uh, of, of what can be uh, gleaned about a company's behavior, opportunities, customer interactions by uh, uh, gathering large amounts of, of data, uh, for example, in a retail environment or on a factory floor, um, putting that information into analytics packages where that can be managed and put together and generate insights and decisions and, and revenue streams. Uh, for the uh, for the en enterprise, um, the um, the amount of of data that's available today on, on systems um, is is uh, continuing to grow at an exponential rate, and uh, it, it, it is only being managed because of the uh, uh, corresponding uh, Moore's law, which is bringing down the cost of data storage and uh, processing power at a, at a comparable rate. But the the amount of you know, I, I, just to give you an anecdote, I, I remember back in the uh, in the mid '80s talking to uh, a, a, a very large uh, uh, data uh, data data company that provided all the research for corporate uh, 500, uh, the Fortune 500 companies, and they were boasting about how they had systems 
that were capable of managing up to two terabytes of, of data. And this was an enormous amount of data um, in, the, uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, kind of staggering amount of, of data. Well, well now your, 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 your PC comes with a terabyte of data on its uh, local drive. So the, the amount of data that we're talking about, um, uh, especially generated from uh, uh, sensors and systems in buildings is, is truly a m monumental amount of, of, of data and, and there are patterns that can be gleaned from that data uh, that are not obvious by, by, by individual data sets but really uh, only appear in, in the aggregate. So CIOs are, are really looking at how do they manage this tsunami of, of, of data and how do they turn that to a corporate uh, advantage and I think that's pushing uh, the, uh, the IT organizations and the CIOs um, in the direction of, of uh, working more closely with the uh, facilities managers and the kind of data that can come from those buildings, whether they be office buildings, whether they be factory floors, or whether they be retail uh, in environments or other, uh, other environments. Uh, meanwhile, the um, facilities managers have day-to-day have -day real-world problems of saying, look, we've been de deploying building automation uh, for, 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 for years. Um, and, and, and we've got real-world problems of managing our facilities, making sure they work, making sure literally that the lights stay on and the trains keep uh, running. Um, um, you know, we, 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 ha we have to kind of keep the operational realities of what we're doing uh, in, in balance with the, the visions of what you can do with all this data and how it makes it work. And, and I think that uh, with, without some kind of uh, systematic approach to uh, inter integrating those solutions and 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 creating the systems that can manage that, uh, you, you know, there, there will be some uh, some some bumpy road ahead in terms of of the uh, you know realizing the enter enterprise IoT vision, which is which is coming and which is being driven uh, by, by by a number of macro forces that we've uh, touched on briefly uh, today, um, and and I think that uh, uh, you know if if you look at most uh, buildings in in well pretty much every, every building in almost every environment, one of the very strong common, common denominators and, and certainly the most ubiquitous uh, type of device that can be networked is lighting. Um, and uh, smart lighting is, uh, 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 has a, 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 you know, uh, you know uh, an interesting but, but fairly small installed base given the I I enormous uh, potential here of, uh, 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 of, of uh, you know, around 2 million units to, uh, you know, uh, two, two orders of magnitude greater growth in the next five or six years to, you know, uh, uh, two and a half to three billion units. So the, the expectation is that lighting is, is, is one area which is ripe for connectivity and it creates a kind of a scaffolding throughout uh, buildings of all types, again, whether they be factory floors, office buildings, retail environments, small box or large box uh, re retail, every place you go that people go, there is lighting um, and, and having uh, a connected uh, mesh of, 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 of nodes uh, provides the, uh, not only the, the energy savings and the ROI by managing that uh, fairly large expenditure of energy and, uh, uh, and operational uh, comfort, but but also creates the access points for a number of other uh, connected devices through that uh, through that network, um, into which you can add HVAC plug loads, fans, and other sensors, uh, and and move forward with an integrated solution, and then connect those to your existing uh, building management systems in a way that that that, that gives you as the uh, as the manager of these assets. Uh, the, the control and the, the visibility that, that, that you, you, you need. Um, so uh, just in summary, before I hand this over to Mandeep, um, I think that you know, what we're talking about here with, with Enterprise I IoT is the connecting together at the macro scale of all of the systems for, uh, for buildings, um, uh, uh, whether it be uh, lighting, thermostats, plug loads, blind controllers, alarms, occupancy sensors, et, et cetera, into a, 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 a unified view across not just one building, but a fleet of buildings um, so that you as the, uh, the manager of that can uh, provide a, 
an integrated view uh, from which you can control the buildings and from which you can uh, uh, take that information and, and, and marry it together with the other data systems in your company to provide uh, a kind of a, 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 a seamless and, and integrated way to uh, manage all of the devices and data in your, uh, in your enterprise. So with that, uh, Mandeep, I'm going to hand uh, control over to you, and uh, I look forward to answering questions uh, at the end of the talk. Thanks very much. Thank you, Derek. Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. So I'll be going through a definition of IoT, a walk through what it means exactly, how it works for smart buildings, and talk about Daintree solutions as well. We've been working on the whole smart building space for a while and have been talking about how Internet of Things fit into the smart buildings as well. So most people that I talk to still don't quite understand what IoT means. A lot of them actually have not even heard the term Internet of Things. So as we walk through these, you'll notice that that's pretty much the norm in the industry as well still. So here's a slide from a survey that we just recently did. And the question was, how familiar are you with Internet of Things? And as you can see, 57% are still not familiar. And that percentage has actually changed over the last few months. It used to be a lot lower of people understanding what IoT is. So at least now there are 43% who are somewhat familiar with IoT. And we've consistently seen the progress in terms of how, how many people understand what IoT means or Internet of Things means. Then we pose the question again after explaining what we believe Internet of Things is or defining it. And as you'll see on this slide, the percentage has changed. So there were more people familiar with IoT, so roughly about 55% were familiar. And of the remaining percentages, pretty significant percentage had heard of it. So the point here is really that most people are actually working with IoT and, and doing things with IoT, but don't even realize that they're doing IoT. And, and so that, that's why once we defined it, it became more apparent that people actually understand the term and just might not be thinking in the same terms as the rest of the industry. So Derek talked about some of the drivers for IoT adoption, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, the barriers to IoT. Clearly, the first one is awareness or lack of awareness. Most people, as you saw in the, in the slides that we just showed you earlier, uh, most people are still not aware of IOTs, so obviously that becomes a major adoption issue. And they don't know how to start, they, and, and I'll be talking about some of that today. And the next issue is security. So, you know, security, uh, having spent a number of years in cybersecurity, I can relate to that. There's a lot of fear-mongering going on as well. It's a real issue, and people do need to think about security, but it doesn't need to be an insurmountable type of a task. So. There are things you can do, you just have to raise the barrier. You can't have a perfect computer or a perfect uh, solution uh, that'll stop the hackers from coming ever. But what you can do is raise the barrier and take precautions at different layers, including data layer, network layer, and application layer, and start securing your environment. So be aware of it, make changes, but don't get bogged down with the fear. And the third issue is privacy, which you should be concerned about. It's a bigger issue right now on the consumer side uh, with Google and everyone else laying in that market who owns the information, how are they using it, and those types of things. On the enterprise IoT, it is becoming an issue as well, and you just need to understand whoever is providing you the solution, that you as customers own the data eventually. It's not the vendors who own the data, So, and, and we need to make sure, as vendors, we have the responsibility to make sure that we protect your data from a security point of view, but also uh, not use the data with your specific information as it relates to your environment. So those are, I would say, are the three biggest barriers. Obviously, there are other things that are impacting IoT, for example, budget, and there are other things associated within a specific environment. Some industries are ahead of uh, others. For example, we are seeing a lot more movement on the uh, retail sector and financial sector, not as much in, in manufacturing. So it, it depends on what specific industrial vertical you are in. The barriers can change as well. So we are obviously trying to raise the awareness of IoT by doing webinars like these and by speaking at conferences. And that's driving a momentum as well for companies because there's a lot to gain from that. So let's go move on to how the building automation and control fits into with EIoT. And if you look at this pie, the idea is basically if the lighting control, which is the smallest piece, is about 1.7 billion. If you add HVAC to it, that's about $4.2 billion market. We see the overall smart buildings, enterprise internet of things market at about 58 billion. Even though Cisco and some of the other companies have put the numbers at trillions of dollars, but we believe conservatively that 58 billion is the right number. 
So if you start with lighting control, add HVAC, and then start adding other devices like plug loads, refrigeration, vending machine, and other types of devices, then essentially the smart building automation piece is the enterprise internet of things because it's not a whole lot left after you've done all of, all of that in a building. And clearly the key things to remember are the devices have to be smart, uh, systems have to be scalable, and you have to follow with open standards as well. And there are a lot of different device types. I mean, there are sensors, there are adapters, and there are different types of machines that need to be connected. So all of them have to use the open standards to connect. And once you have the foundation for that, uh, then you can keep adding other devices as necessary. So you can start achieving uh, not only energy efficiencies from building energy management and smart buildings, but also start achieving operational efficiencies as necessary. So a little bit about the entry networks. And we are roughly about 600. Actually, the number has even gone up since we prepared the slides. It's, it's closer to about 800 smart buildings across the US, over 100 million square feet under management. And our primary sectors that we focus on are industrial warehouse, retail, banks, commercial offices, parking garages, and education as well. So if you look at the architecture of how we are structured, so the three layers uh, to our architecture, uh, one is the software piece that sits on a server. That's where you define all your control strategies, for example, dimming, preset temperatures, on off, based on occupancy, and those types of things. And then you can also get all the data analytics, the dashboard, the reporting on energy consumption and savings on the software as well. Inside the building, we have the gateway, we call it wireless area controller, that sits on an ethernet, and it takes the control strategies from the server in the back end. And that's kind of the brain of the operation because it's controlling the endpoint devices. And the endpoint devices, of course, are lights. Lighting is the most common one because it's the most prevalent network but also thermostats and vending machines and refrigerations and so on and so forth. And the benefits, as you can see from this, I mean, you can control all the devices from anywhere at any time over the web. You can reduce energy up to 70%, achieve a lot of operational efficiencies, and occupant comfort, which is becoming a big issue now. We've seen uh, percentages anywhere from 3% to 25% productivity gain if you're controlling a building with lighting and thermostat in a proper way, which is, those numbers can be huge when you look at the grand scheme of things. Sustainability goals has also become a bigger issue now because more and more companies are focused on reducing CO2 emissions, and you can have a direct impact on that by having these kinds of solutions in place. So if you look at the control scope versus others, legacy systems typically were wired systems uh, focused on either lighting or HVAC or plug loads or, or some specific type of device, and they were wired. So customers had to go buy different systems and then use wires, which is very expensive, and then bring them all together. With control scope, the whole idea is it's wireless, simple, elegant architecture, one solution, one platform that supports all of those things. So the lighting, the thermostats, the, the plug loads, and, and all of that. And the beauty of this is because it's simple and elegant, because it's wireless, and because it uses a wireless mesh network, it's very economical, uh, very cost effective, and easy to implement. We also connect our system to automated demand response for with utility. So talking about wireless mesh networks, so uh, this kind of diagram shows the same architecture with a little bit more on the mesh network. So the whole idea behind mesh network, and, and I think a lot of people still don't quite understand what that means, is that each device is actually talking to the neighboring device. So you're not worried about a single point of failure from the gateway, so every sensor, every adapter, that has the Zigbee chip in it can talk to the device next to it. And so you don't need to have the wireless area controller or the gateway in line of sight. And you can just go hop from one, one device to another device to communicate what needs to be done. So for example, if a sensor goes out, then the existing sensor will go to the next sensor that's available. And then that sensor can communicate to the next adapter or sensor or any other device that has the Zigbee. So they're all connected in, in a mesh versus a broadcast system like a Wi-Fi where you have one gateway and that's trying to communicate to all the devices and, and that, that makes it very inefficient because it has to be in line of sight and that's why Wi-Fi and other types of technologies are not really practical solutions for smart building automation or even IoT. And as you can see on, on this diagram, we, we're showing both energy and non-energy devices uh, which leads me to this roadmap device which kind of shows how a customer can start with lighting. So a lot of, and you can actually start at any point, but lighting controls makes the most sense. 
because it's the most prevalent network, gives you the biggest savings. So you can start with lighting controls, or you can do multiple things at the same time. And then you can add thermostat controls, uh, you can add plug load controls, general purpose controls, some metering, uh, space planning, those types of things. And then you can start adding vending machines, refrigeration, and those types of devices as well, all using the same platform. So now you don't have to worry about adding another product to support new types of devices. And that's kind of how you achieve Internet of Things within an enterprise, because you're starting with one specific area, and then you keep expanding. And because the platform is wireless, because it's open, and it has interoperability, adding other types of things or devices is more modular. So you just basically go and, and say, okay, now I have the budget to add other things, or I have the requirements to add other things, or my organization is ready to do this now, because you do have to get everyone involved, all the stakeholders. But it's easy to then just keep on adding new types of modules. We also have requests, for example, about adding security cameras. So you can tie a specific occupancy for security reasons with a camera. So what does this all mean to you? First of all, you're already doing IoT. If you're a facility manager uh, or an energy or sustainability manager, you are doing IoT. You are doing Internet of Things without even realizing it. Any kind of energy savings measures with technology that you're doing and connecting various things, that is IoT, or at least the beginning of IoT. The other thing I want to emphasize and highlight is that you will play a pivotal role in this revolution. I mean, your skills will be extremely valuable to your CIO and CTO. Just to give you an anecdote, I was speaking at a customer facility with uh, multiple VPs of real estate involved, and when I talked about IoT, they had never even heard the term IoT. Uh, and these are senior VPs of facilities in real estate, and I was a little surprised, and first I thought well, they were joking, but then I saw their serious faces, and I started explaining to them what an Internet of Things really means and, and, the, and how it's going to impact their career, because they are the drivers of enterprise IoT. And their eyes lit up and they wanted to know all this information. So, uh, so my advice to you and also in terms of where we want to go with this is to, to really feel proud of what you're doing as you embark on this journey. CIO, CIO, CTOs will rely on you. But you also have to do your homework. So you need to gain knowledge. You should become an expert on these technologies. Learn about connectivity, learn about data, learn about security issues with buildings and IoT and other related topics. And more importantly, start communicating more with CIO, CTO, because they'll be driving IoT initiatives from top. You'll be starting the IoT initiatives, or actually already are doing, from bottom. And somehow these two things need to come together, the chasm. And I've written a blog on this uh, called Operational Technology and, and IT Technology Fusion, so please go check it out. It's on our website and LinkedIn. So top five strategies to roll out enterprise IoT. So first is don't boil the ocean. You don't want to do everything at once. You'll get overwhelmed and might not have as much of a success as you would like. So start slowly, but, but keep the long-term view so you know where you're going with that. Get all the key stakeholders involved up front. Every single organization will be impacted. It's not only just facilities, every department, uh, marketing, sales, support, everyone who's in that building will be impacted. Employees, all the employees will be impacted by how this is implemented. Decide who's driving the strategy. Is it the CIO? Is it the VP of operations? What roles each of them will play? And then, you know, do we go tops down from CIO or bottoms up or where do we merge? And communication will help in that. Data is king. So at the end of the day, it's all about big data analytics. So all the data we'll be collecting from sensors and adapters and devices, all of those have to come together. But data is not information. So data has to be converted into decision support information so you can make intelligent decisions and really achieve efficiencies based on that. Focus on open standards. There's no way you can do IoT successfully without open standards and without wireless. It's just not going to happen. So focus on that. Don't get stuck in the proprietary protocol. So to end, I just want to make sure that we have given you enough information so you know what enterprise Internet of Things. I think most people have even forgotten what Internet means, and, and most people associate just Facebook as the Internet. So at least now you know, hopefully, what enterprise IoT means. And with that, we've run out of time, but we'll uh, now spend some time taking your uh, questions. Thank you very much for your time, and please come to your website and check all the information we have on there as well. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Derek and Mandeep, for your presentations there, and to our attendees, of course. Uh, we will now address uh, many of the questions that have come in during the presentation. 
so let's start off with, uh, let's see, Derek, I think this uh, might be best to start out with you. Uh, it is a question, you were talking about the large amount of data and, and, and over the years the amount of data that has uh, grown that's available to us. So one of the questions we had was big data is overwhelming to most individuals. Um, do you agree? And um, what, what have you seen about concerns about sorting through all this big data? Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting question, and I think it's very uh, c current right now. Um, I, I I think there's um, uh, probably uh, maybe three three levels of of concern um, from the uh, uh, you know uh, you know at at the information scientist point of view, uh, the, the the question is. Um, where where are my data sets coming from, and um, you know uh, can can I uh, can I actually get information out of these uh, huge amounts of, of 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 data that I'm that I'm working with? Uh, there has been quite a lot of, of advancements in in database technology and analytical techniques for for managing it, um, and there are a lot of companies who are uh, uh, focused on 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 those aspects. But uh, it, it's very much a question of, of garbage in, garbage out, and, and a lot of the data that people need to, 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 to do a good job simply isn't available because the, uh, the, the information isn't, isn't getting captured. Um, so the, um, you know, one, one, one of the issues with, with big, big data is huge amounts of, of, of data, but is that data really giving me a good picture because is it, it, you know, are, are the data sources that I'm, I'm, I'm getting representative of what I care about. So one, one aspect there is by, uh, uh, you know, providing a richer picture of what's going on in a, a facility or a retail perspective by having a better collections of sensors and things give you the data uh, that's actually meaningful as opposed to the old joke of, you know, why are you looking for your car keys under the street lamp if you didn't lose them there because well, that's where the light is. The same, the same issues here. We're, we're analyzing lots of, of data, but it's not necessarily the data we want. Um, an, 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 another issue um, ha has to do with um, um, uh, uh, the the um, uh, you know uh, how you know how how do we aggregate that data and how do we manage that data because a huge you know you you need to sort of uh, you, you know e e even with the you know vastly reduced cost of of, of data storage. Uh, the amount of data coming online is is, is growing at such a, a rapid pace from uh, automated sensors that you have to be intelligent about um, extracting information from that data, uh, compacting it into some kind of, of of report, and then basically deleting gigantic masses of stuff. So you need to you need to aggregate the data. You need to be intelligent about how you're how you're managing it so that you get. Um, useful information uh, from 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 the data. So not only do you have to have uh, uh, good data sources, um, but you also have to have uh, good data analytics. Uh, and then the the final thing, which I think is from a consumer perspective a concern always all the time, is you know privacy information. There's you know huge amounts of systems out there gathering all kinds of data. How, how do we how do we get the useful information that we want, which is typically aggregate information, um, while um, uh, you know, while, while, while um, uh, keeping it to some extent uh, anonymous. Now, a lot of the sensor data that we're talking about here really doesn't give you personal information. It gives you more occupancy, pat occupancy patterns, how people move around, energy usage, those kinds of things. But certainly, with uh, uh, video data and those kinds of things, that you can you can get into a different issue. And, and I think there you start to move into the realm of of, um, of policy um, and, and also into the realm of of um, statistical and aggregated data. Um, so, I mean, I think that it's a it's a multi-pronged approach to, to to deal with the data issues, but I do, I do think that the value that can be gathered um, is is quite high. Thank you. Um, so, let's see. Um, have you pulled any in your with your solution at Daintree? Um, do you have any examples of, or have you pulled any um, ROI data in your in your work? What, what kind of obviously you have, but what kind of you know examples or ROI um, information can you share with us? Yeah, maybe I can take that. Uh, it's 
from an ROI point of view, as I mentioned, you know, we can, um, we've saved up to 70% energy and, and typical, you know, payback periods, uh, we're seeing anywhere from one to three years, which is excellent um, by any standard. However, we go back and we tell the customers, look, you know, don't look at just energy efficiency because that's just a small piece of the overall pie. Um, you have to look at operational efficiencies and you have to look at um, occupant comfort and those types of things and, and rebates that you're getting in. Once you add all of those pieces, uh, we've seen payback periods go down to half a year, uh, which is uh, unbelievable. Um, so it's very easy to prove, easy to show. I think if you, but you have to consider all the different parameters, not not a single focus uh, on energy. Okay. So then, besides energy savings, um, what other kinds of uh, what else can building automation and IoT provide in a practical way? What other um, you know, benefits or, or outcomes have, have you seen in your experience with, with facilities people? Yeah, I can I can provide some and then if Derek wants to add. Um, so, you know, for example, predictive maintenance types of things um, within the operational efficiency category. Um, that's been extremely uh, important. Uh, uh, fault detection. So, for example, if you have a, a retail chain or a restaurant chain, uh, that has the light, the signage light out in the front, and guess what happens if that light is out? Uh, consumers don't go in. Uh, so it's a direct hit to revenues. So if, what if you knew uh, that, you know, that specific light is out, so now you can send someone right away to fix that. That could be huge uh, impact on revenues. So that's just one example, but there's, there are so many different things you can do once you have the data available and, and um, as Derek was pointing out earlier, once you uh, really have the right analytics on that data, then now you can leverage that for all kinds of things, including occupancy and, and various other uh, things within the building. So I don't know, Derek, if you want to add something to that. Uh, no, I think I think you covered. I mean, I think that the um, uh, you know in 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 retail in retail environments uh, the the ability to uh, 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 you know uh, d dynamically change for example um, you know the, uh, the 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 price tags on on things within a grocery store or a customer environment um, the ability to um, uh, 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 you know c connect um, uh, via Bluetooth or beacons uh, to uh, to consumers' handsets and 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 interact with them at at that level. Um, I think the um, uh, uh, you know many of the preventative maintenance things that you touched on are are big you know hard dollar savings for uh, uh, for, for 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 customers. I think uh, I integrating with um, um, uh, you know uh, uh, the uh, the safety the safety components of a building all, all of those things are are, are quite valuable um, and 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 that you know and and then the the uh, you know the 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 the, the data uh, uh, that you generate for example if you have occupancy sensors to to turn on or turn off lights you can also track the movements of of employees in a building or customers in a building and get a sense of uh, kind of heat map data that tells you um, you know, is is the uh, is the floor plan laid out efficiently for the movement of customers through the building or for the uh, utilization of the space in a, in a building? There there are, there are many many things that can be that, that are of interest and can be done um, uh, once once you have a a, a, a wireless uh, mesh in place. Thank you, and uh, Derek or Mandeep, um, can you there was some some conversation about open standards and, and the benefit of open standards in developing IoT or implementing it, I should say. So um, I guess the question is, can you implement IoT without open standards? Uh, and if you are doing without open standards, kind of what's the uh, trade-off there? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think that from a, a, a technical perspective, uh, certainly the answer is you can you can implement IoT uh, with proprietary standards or with uh, with open standards. From a uh, financial or economic point of view, uh, the, it, it's a question of whether it's uh, uh, in, in the long term uh, uh, financially feasible or, or prudent to, uh, to get wedded to a proprietary uh, system. In, in, in particular, uh, typically proprietary uh, 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 standards will, will be limited to not only Pr pr proprietary protocols on the network, but because of that, you will have a much. Uh, you, you can only utilize uh, those devices which uh, which which interoperate with that protocol, which means you, you you tend to be stuck buying the devices from the particular vendor who um, 
as that protocol. With with open standards, you have a more of an open marketplace of of end devices, whether those be uh, uh, light, lighting systems or thermostats or plug loads or any any, any device uh, at that level, and and so you let the um, um, you know the the open marketplace compete for the best quality uh, end product and end devices as well as the best quality and best uh, price point. It, it's very much you know to to draw the analogy that that I used early on of comparing the early days of of, of networking in um, uh, the computer world. Um, certainly, uh, you know the the ma mainframe systems and the mini computer systems of the 70s, 80s, and even early 90s. Um, had proprietary protocols for interconnecting their uh, their systems, um, but in, in the long run, they were just overwashed by an open standard like the internet, where um, you know lo lo lower cost PCs and the huge array of of um, third party device manufacturers and people who uh, software uh, ISCs who supported that standard just created a, a much richer uh, environment for. Uh, businesses and consumers alike to, to to choose from, such that you know the the you know average uh, uh, personal computer today is is much more powerful uh, at a fraction of the cost than the than the mainframes of uh, of, of of 20 25 years ago, uh, and, and and that I think is really what you you'll see in in the building automation case as well. Uh, o open standards will tend to bring in. Uh, a, a, a wide range of vendors that you can choose from. So I, I think that from a practical point of view, and if you if you're concerned about um, future proofing your your environment, open standards are are a good way to go. Um, but but if you just have a you know a, a very short term need and you're not really worried about the long term uh, impact, and and there's a, a a vendor that you like, then you know uh, you, you're you're not you're not stuck with that. You you can do whatever you like. Thank you. And along those lines, open standards is, is obviously an important issue here. Um, in terms of implementation or starting out uh, into the, you know, getting into the enterprise IoT um, journey, what are the most important elements that our facility management listeners should be looking for um, in an enterprise IoT solution uh, in terms of starting out? Are, are, is there any, I guess, pointers or tips or specific elements you could point out? Yeah, I think um, so. I Go ahead, Mandy. No, no. I was just going to say, I, I think some of the things that we've already touched on, obviously, uh, the fact that open standards um, is extremely critical uh, for any type of rollout for these solutions, um, and an ability to have the right amount of data um, is, is another big piece of it. So, uh, the third piece is the scalability, right? So, if you're doing enterprise-wide rollout of an IoT initiative. Uh, can you really scale the solution uh, from a centralized point of view, or is it just a small local conference room type of an environment, which is not IoT in my opinion? So, so those are some of the things. And um, Derek, you might have some others. No, I, I think those are. I think I think you know pro probably the most important thing uh, that you should be looking for is you know d does. Um, does the solution that I'm considering meet my immediate needs um, at, at a price point that makes sense for me today? Um, and um, is it extensible in a way that, you know, if, if I want to add on to the system in a year from now or two years from now or 10 years from now, I, I believe that that, that, um, uh, that that solution is, is going to be, uh, you know, a, a, able to, uh, to to uh, to support the the needs for my enterprise and my building, uh, you know, for a reasonable uh, lifetime, which I, I would think in in the building cases, you know, probably at least a ten year ten year period. So thinking about you know the future requirements and the ability to um, uh, uh, to, to to be able to grow with a system is is an is an important is an important piece. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Um, okay, well, it looks like we are out of time, so I do want to thank you again, Derek and Mandeep, for the presentation, uh, and to Daintree Networks for sponsoring the webinar, and of course to our, all of our attendees. A uh, recording of the webinar will be available to you online at facilityexecutive.com, as well as on the Daintree website, which is daintree.net. Thanks for joining us, and have a great day.